Today, we step into the quiet streets of Johnstown, New York, where Elizabeth Alley Lamont vanished without a trace on 29th October 2019. Who's the mastermind behind Alley's mysterious vanishing act? Is it the boyfriend with the quirky graveyard alibi? Or could it be the ex-boyfriend with a history of domestic abuse? Or is Alley herself the maestro orchestrating her disappearances like she has done before? Brace yourselves for a journey into the enigmatic disappearance of Ali Lamont. I'm an alcoholic. Do not tell my boss. <laughs> On a Tuesday, October night in Johnstown, New York, Officer Chad Simonson, stationed at the Gloversville Police Department, found himself entangled in a cryptic puzzle as the clock ticked toward 10 p.m. The harsh ring of the phone cut through the quiet police station. Officer Simonson, alert and ready, reached for the receiver. A hushed urgency emanated from the voice on the other end as Elizabeth Lamont's sister broke the silence. Her tone trembled with concern, each word laced with a chilling anxiety. None of the Lamont family had heard from 22-year-old Elizabeth Alley Lamont since the previous day. In that moment, the ordinary small-town police station transformed into a theater of mystery with Officer Simonson cast as the lead detective in a story that would unravel the enigma surrounding Allie's disappearance. The stage was set for a drama that would unravel the secrets hidden beneath the surface of Allie Lamont's seemingly ordinary life. Elizabeth Lamont, affectionately known as Allie, came into this world on a cold December 4, 1996, in the small town of Johnstown, New York. The Lamont family, anchored by parents Sherman and Krista, formed a tight-knit unit with three daughters, Carly, Allie, and Lou Ellen. Allie cherished the bonds with her sisters, turning the ordinary moments of sisterhood into lifelong memories. In the modest Lamont house, the currency was love, not wealth, as they thrived on the strength of familial ties and the shared warmth that emanated from within. Allie's journey through Gloversville High School started in 2011 when Allie navigated the halls with a determination that hinted at dreams bigger than the small town could contain. The turning point in Allie's life came in 2019 when, at the age of 22, she started living with her childhood friend, Jenny, and Jenny's son. A crucial step toward her goal came in March 2019 when she got a job at a popular deli called Local Substation, famous for its fresh sandwiches. Without a car, she relied on her roommate Jenny for rides. Allie was determined to climb the ranks at work, starting behind the counter and advancing over time. Allie's hard work didn't go unnoticed by her boss, Georgios Cacavelos, who owned the deli. Soon, she took on management duties alongside the official manager, James Duffy, whom everyone called Jimmy. Allie considered Jimmy a good friend, along with his girlfriend Kristen, another co-worker. Then came the evening of Tuesday, October 29, 2019, when Officer Chad Simonson received that phone call. Two days before Halloween, on Tuesday, October 29, 2019, the Gloversville Police Department received a call around 10 p.m. Officer Chad Simonson answered, and it was one of Allie's older sisters expressing concern. None of the Lamont family had heard from Allie since the previous day. Officer Simonson took immediate action. He gathered information about Allie and her last known address, 71 Division Street Apartment 1, before heading there, a short three-minute drive from the police station. However, it turned out to be an old address, and Allie was living with her friend Jenny. As it turns out, Jenny was also worried. Around 11 p.m., Officer Simonson received a call from Jenny. Concerned, she decided to file a missing persons report. Officer Simonson drove to Jenny's to question her about the last time Jenny saw Allie at work on October 28th. According to Jenny, Allie had texted her asking for her phone charger, and Jenny dropped it off at the deli around 4 p.m. That was the last time Jenny saw her. 
Despite texting Allie later in the evening about her work schedule and when to pick her up, there was no response. Jenny informed Officer Simonson that Allie didn't return home that night. Alarmed by the situation, Jenny went to Allie's workplace the next morning, only to find out that Allie wasn't scheduled to work that day. The next sensible step for Officer Simonson was to reach out to Allie's boyfriend, William. Despite the late hour, Simonson didn't hesitate. He drove over. However, upon arrival, William was nowhere to be seen. Instead, his brother greeted the officer at the door, revealing that William was currently out searching for Allie. It appeared that no one within Allie's tight-knit circle of friends and family had any clue about her whereabouts. It was then Simonson decided to issue a bolo, alerting law enforcement agencies statewide to be on the lookout for Allie, intensifying the search for the missing 22-year-old woman in the small town of Gloversville. By the morning of October 30th, Officer Simonson's night shift had ended, and there were still no reports of Allie being spotted. Simonson briefed his shift sergeant, who, upon learning the details, decided to escalate the investigation. Detectives Gillian Faville and Detective Sergeant Lucas Nellis were assigned to the case. Detectives Faville and Nellis began by revisiting Jenny to gather information about Allie's last known moments. According to Jenny, there was nothing unusual about Allie's demeanor when she dropped off her phone charger. The detectives probed further, asking if Allie had any issues with anyone or if there were personal problems that might make her want to leave town. Jenny, however, mentioned that Allie had recently started dating someone named William, and their relationship seemed normal. According to Jenny, Allie was in good spirits and excited about their Halloween plans going trick-and-treating with Jenny's son. As the investigation progressed, the detectives discovered a domestic abuse incident involving Allie's ex-boyfriend, Tyler. This raised concerns, prompting the detectives to investigate Tyler's possible involvement. However, Tyler was not at his last known address, leading them to explore other leads for the time being. They then contacted William Deming, Allie's current boyfriend, who shared his side of the story. William recounted that they were texting throughout October 28th, but suddenly, Allie's responses stopped around 6 p.m. Despite multiple attempts to contact her, he received no response after that point. He informed the detectives that Allie typically visited his place after work on most days, but on that particular night, he hadn't heard from her. They were supposed to meet the next day to carve pumpkins with his son, but Allie never showed up. Perplexed about her sudden disappearance, William decided to meet some friends that night, and where did they end up? A rather unconventional choice, the cemetery. According to William, they went there for some beers, a peculiar but perhaps fitting setting close to Halloween. William shared with the detectives that after their unconventional gathering, he crashed at a friend's house. Throughout the night, his worry for Allie kept him awake. Unable to make contact the next day, he embarked on a tireless search. William spent hours scouring the woods, checking roadsides, and even joined forces with Jenny in a joint effort to locate Allie. Since William had an alibi, the detectives delved into Allie's personal contacts. Meanwhile, her friends and family took matters into their own hands. They utilized social media to spread the word, reaching out to news stations, posting missing persons posters, and conducting their own search efforts. A Facebook update by Allie's sister on October 30th revealed that Allie's phone had pinged four miles away in Hales Mills before being shut off. This information was perplexing, as it was out of the way for Allie and didn't align with her usual roots. The community's concern grew, and people rallied together in the search for Allie, determined to bring her home safely. On that very day, the detectives finally reached Allie's ex-boyfriend, Tyler, who agreed to undergo questioning. His criminal history, marked by disorderly conduct complaints and a previous domestic incident with Allie, immediately flagged him as a person of interest. Despite Tyler's questionable reputation, he appeared remarkably cooperative during the interrogation. In the course of the interview, Tyler disclosed that he and Allie had engaged in a domestic dispute that escalated physically. 
He admitted to her sustaining injuries, but insisted it was an isolated incident, the first and last in their four-year relationship. According to Tyler, the altercation occurred about two months ago, when Ali unexpectedly showed up at his apartment, accusing him of cheating with one of her best friends. When questioned about how Ali got injured, Tyler asserted he had to restrain her due to her combative behavior. Tyler, in his version, claimed he blocked all communication with Ali after the heated encounter, emphasizing his innocence regarding her disappearance. Despite their history of violence, the detectives, unwilling to close the chapter, maintained scrutiny of Tyler. His story, while somewhat exonerating, didn't absolve him entirely, yet lacking concrete evidence, he was released. Digging deeper into Tyler and Allie's relationship, the detectives cross-referenced statements with other accounts. Oddly, there appeared to be no recent communication between Allie and Tyler. Interestingly, this wasn't the first time Allie had gone missing. As a teenager, she had a history of running away, prompting numerous missing persons reports. However, this disappearance presented a stark contrast. She was now a responsible adult with a steady job, regularly in touch with her family, and had never been missing for such an extended period before. The detectives then decided to question her co-worker. They learned from owner, Georgios, and manager, Jimmy, at Local 9, that the last time anyone had seen Ali was on October 28th. Georgios, the owner, expressed deep concern for Ali's well-being, revealing that she had confided in him about dealing with depression and having thoughts of ending her life. Giorgio saw Ali as a daughter and was genuinely worried about her. On the night of October 28th, a mishap occurred at the shop where soda machines leaked all over the floor. Giorgio suggested that she go home, relax, and take the rest of the night off. Additionally, he provided her with a $500 cash advance as a loan to help her in securing her own apartment. Ali signed a handwritten note that outlined the terms of repayment $50 installments until the $500 was fully paid. Despite Giorgios's efforts to contact Ali after that night, there had been no response from her. Giorgios handed over the signed note to the investigators, emphasizing that Ali had not been in touch since that evening. The detectives now had more details about Ali's state of mind, her financial concerns, and the potential stress she was experiencing. The question loomed, had Allie taken her own life? With this new information, the investigation took a closer look at Allie's interactions at Local 9, hoping that her co-workers, Jimmy, Kristen, and Nicole, could provide additional insights. Detectives asked Georgios if they could look around the place to which he said, yes, and invited them in. Detectives were free to walk through of the entire property and whatever they needed. Georgios was there to help. It was a chaotic scene, and it did indeed look like it was under construction. Walls were being torn down in the middle of the building, floors that needed to be scrubbed of what looked like a major soda leak. There was soda syrup all over the tile floors. Some employees were in the middle of cleaning when the investigators came through. The manager, Jimmy, kind of acknowledged that this was the normal course of business for them. Giorgio saw Jimmy as a son. Jimmy had worked at other businesses that Georgios ran, and he had him come to manage and open the local nine. But something was off about Jimmy. He appeared to be disoriented at work. As a matter of fact, he was definitely intoxicated that morning, and it was only 11 a.m. Investigators asked Jimmy and Georgios to come down to the station, and both made formal statements. Once they're there, they're put in two separate rooms, and that's when it becomes even more obvious that Jimmy is heavily intoxicated, and it's very hard to get him to focus on anything. Listen, I want you to find my friend. I want you to bring my worker back to work, and I want you to sit there and fucking return my life back to work. He's all over the place, standing up, sitting down, slurring his words, even yelling at the investigators to find his friend. I'm an alcoholic, and I'm a drug addict. Do not tell my boss. <laughs> Jimmy confided in the investigators, I'm an alcoholic and I'm a drug addict. 
do not tell my boss. He appeared to be genuinely interested in assisting the investigators in finding his friend, Ali, but because of his demeanor, it was really hard to have a conversation with him. The investigators move on to the boss. They've gotten enough from Jimmy, and Georgios explains the last time he saw Ali. He tells them that day. It was Monday, October 28th. The soda machines needed changing, so he went there to assist Jimmy. The syrup uh, situation. She complained. She didn't want to do it. <laughs> she left around what time, do you think? Purity death. So she took the $500 that night mm -hmm. and then left. What time she left? I would gotta say anywhere between 7 to 8. Soda machines had been out of order for a while. They needed to get fixed and they needed to be worked on as soon as possible. So Allie's up front. She's taking orders. Well, one of the men that's working on the soda machines accidentally cut one of the hoses that led to the soda syrup and created the mess. Georgios decided to let Allie leave early. He saw she was under a lot of pressure. He gave her the loan that she needed, and that was the last time he saw her. She said, thank you, George. She said, thank you. Yes, okay. she said, thank you, George. I said, just be good. I yelled, just be good. And then she left. When investigators asked for an approximate time that they think she left, it was between 7 and 8 p.m. that night. So there you have it. Both Jimmy and Georgios saw Ali the same day that everyone else last spoke to her. She was helping with the syrup situation. She complained she didn't want to do it and was allowed to leave early. But she was troubled, girl. Rough. She, it was rough. I tried to help her. I tried to be a father to her a few times. Her boyfriend was beating her up. I felt bad for her. I treated her literally as a daughter of mine. I don't want to be here. I had enough of this. I said, you, you mean you don't want to work anymore? I have enough of my life, she said. The questioning took an odd turn when the investigators inquired if Georgios thought Jimmy was intoxicated for a reason. Jimmy was present when she was last seen, openly acknowledging his substance abuse issues a risky mix. The one thing we never talked to you about is, do you think Jim had anything to do with this between us? I really don't think so. He doesn't have the balls to do something like this. Like anything that harmed to her or uh, do anything to her or anything like that? They were friends. They were bodies. George dismisses it, asserting Jimmy wouldn't harm her. They were friends, close. Georgios denies any involvement, refusing to believe Jimmy is involved. While the detective hadn't found any reason to question Georgios's account thus far, something about the final segment of their conversation raised suspicions. Jimmy's demeanor had been notably suspicious during his own interview, and when pressed about it, Georgios appeared reluctant to delve into the matter. As investigators probed Georgios about his recent conversations or messages with Jimmy, his cooperation dwindled. Initially agreeing to share call records, Georgios became visibly less cooperative when confronted with a 36-minute call and a voice message from Jimmy. He hesitated to play the message, insisting on reviewing it privately first. He attributed his reluctance to concerns about potential sexual content, discussing women, attempting to downplay the significance of the situation. So keep going down, keep. Then there's a couple calls, James right there. This one's 36 minutes long. 36 minutes. You're the one with the information right now that can help us solve this. But I'm not denying you the information. What I'm denying you is, is a lot of private, personal information. He has a, a bad side. He has a bad side. Are you sticking up for Jimmy? I don't give a shit if he... Why are you sticking up for Jimmy? Are you, are you, are you what sense up? you mean? Like, maybe he had something to do with it and you just don't want to come forward? What's the conversation you had with Jimmy that day? I want to remember it first. Because if, if it revolves around women, I don't want to play. Women? I don't care. You think we care? I don't care. I know, but I don't really care. I do. 
So you're not letting us listen. That's why I'm taking it right now. I prefer not. The dynamic between them raised suspicions. They're hiding something. Despite exerting pressure on Georgios with no success, the detectives opted to stop the interview. On the morning of October 31st, the very next day, detectives made an unannounced visit to Jimmy Duffy's home. Their plan was straightforward. They arrived early, hoping to engage with the 33-year-old manager before he could do drugs. As soon as Jimmy was brought to the station, it became evident that this interview would differ significantly. He appeared sober and notably less confrontational than the previous day, but he still claimed ignorance about Allie's whereabouts. I want you to find her, okay? Trust me, I do, because I want my friend back, okay? Not only was she my friend, she was a fucking hellfire worker that I can never replace. If something happens to this girl, you gotta tell her. Are you this guy that was around for a fucking accident? And like, you feel awful about it, but you're about to tell us? Or are you this guy that- No, no, you know, bro, listen. No, you keep, yo, listen, I told you. She was sorry when I seen her last. But after a few hours of working with him, Jimmy acknowledged that he had kept some details to himself, but insisted on certain conditions. He wanted a deal, no matter what he revealed to the detectives, he would leave the interrogation room a free man. I want it signed by the DA. That everything, that you guys leave me the fuck alone. I walk out of here, you put me on a bus, and I can go. He insisted on the DA signing off on it, envisioning a swift exit, bus ride and all. I don't want to promise you anything I can't, so that's why I'm talking to you. It's because she overdosed, and she's some this. I can tell you that we can get that. Obviously, if she's chopped up into pieces, you know, we're, it's different. No promises, just assurances. The detectives skillfully led him on without making false promises. No guarantees, just James crafting assumptions in his mind. That's when his demeanor completely changed. <laughs> James confessed, finally unraveling the truth about what really happened to Allie. Georgios paid him $500 to get high and build courage for the sinister task. He supplied a case of beer for good measure, according to his story to the police after closing at 7 p.m. Allie was in the back, wrapping up. He gave me $500 to do all these drugs. So that way I could build up the courage to do this. Bought me a case of beer. Jimmy disclosed a chilling sequence. After the attack, they loaded Allie's into Giorgios's compact Volkswagen, heading east of town. Jimmy believed the situation had concluded, but the next day, when the police started sniffing around, Giorgios told him that there were some loose ends they needed to tie. The next night, they returned to the location where they had left Allie. Georgios paid Jimmy with money, essentially hiring him for the task. Jimmy led the police to the site where they recovered the weapon and cleaning materials. The police, utterly stunned, grappled with Jimmy's horrifying revelation. Georgios was swiftly brought in. He defiantly pointed out. Yesterday, you didn't read my rights. The fact you read my rights today, that's a sign to me. You're taking the conversation now from he said versus what I said. I'm not going to do that without an attorney. Can I call my attorney first? Put your hand behind your back. Do you understand that? Yeah. You're under arrest. We charged th In the Saratoga County Jail, 34-year-old Jimmy Duffy and 51-year-old Georgios Cacavelos sat without bail. Both faced charges of murder. Jimmy Duffy took a plea deal, admitting to second-degree murder and agreeing to testify against Georgios. His chilling testimony, delivered with a disturbing lack of emotion, painted a grim picture. Jimmy's statement before being sentenced to 18 years to life echoed the haunting reality. Nothing I could say is going to bring back Elizabeth. In stark contrast, Georgios pleaded not guilty to Ali's murder. 
his defense strategy unveiled a shocking story. He claimed to be present at the deli when Jimmy attacked Ali. In Giorgio's version, he was a protector, someone Jimmy looked up to. Over the years, Giorgios had taken care of Jimmy, painting himself as the benevolent figure who, unfortunately, fell victim to manipulation due to Jimmy's struggles with substance abuse. The prosecutor's rebuttal blew Giorgios' defense into pieces. They argued that Jimmy is not a model citizen, but this is a murder-for-hire case, and you don't enlist an angel for the devil's work. Jimmy Duffy was the perfect pawn for Giorgios, a key player in this sinister plot. Crucially, evidence emerged against Giorgios regarding his alibi, claiming he left the deli to fetch cleaning supplies after the murder, fearing for his life. However, security footage and a receipt told a different story. Instead of heading to Walmart, he treated himself to an almond joy and some light reading material, a magazine to flick through. Not the best optics and the jury agreed when they rendered the guilty verdict. The jury's unanimous guilty verdict echoed through the courtroom, not only on the charge of first-degree murder, but also on counts of second-degree conspiracy. The gravity of the crimes weighed heavily, and Giorgios Cacavelos faced a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. May you find solace in the light, and may the memories of Elizabeth Ali Lamont endure as a testament to the resilience of the human spirit. Take care, stay vigilant, and may the mysteries of your own stories be woven with threads of hope and truth. Like and subscribe for more such videos.